Hello and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show. I'm your host Paul Rook and on tonight's show we are joined as always by my two favourite co-hosts, Kerry Greenaway and Richard Clements. Hello guys. Hello. Hi there. Hi there. Your favourite co-host. That's good. That's yeah, good to hear. I know, that's yeah. quite, quite nice Rich, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I, th- I thought it'd be nice to you today. Aww. What's the after? <laughs> <laughs> we'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, dear. So how's your weekend gone, Kerry? Yeah, not too bad. I do. Um, I would just like to address the, the elephant that's in the room for everybody. We wish everybody well out there. Stay safe. Um, but please don't panic. You know, that, that's the main point at the moment is, is not to panic. Um, measures are being taken. Just go by the guidelines of what people are saying. And self-care is, is important. But please don't panic. Um, it, you know, we're seeing a, on an unprecedented situation unfolding in the world global situation at the moment. Um, and it's changing minute by minute, isn't it, at the moment, lads? So, you know, please, everybody, just stay calm. Don't panic. Yeah, that, go especially to the, in the UK, where, they, where they're panic buying toilet roll. I know. I don't that get is. that. I don't get the uh-huh. toilet roll. I think that's the same in quite a few countries by looking at my social media feed. But as you say, Kerry, I echo the sentiments you just uh, imparted with the audience. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of false information being fed out there on social medias, actually. You know, um, a lot of false information. Look at the ratios. Look at the, the figures that are coming out in Relation to the global response, that's not adding up to me. I don't, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theory here because you can easily looking at the situation, can't you? Well, there's a few show, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole different show. <laughs> there, there's a few around at the moment, but yeah, no, just ignore them. Yeah. No, just try and keep it in perspective and self care. And if you are at risk, take precautions, you know, like you would normally if there was an epidemic of something going on, you know, um, and just follow the guidelines. But just try not to panic is, is my main advice. Yeah. But even I, I'm quite level headed um, about things like this. And even I'm getting a little bit like freaked out. I'm not going to lie over it um, because of what I'm seeing, you know. But Italy is singing. That That's actually something that has been quite uplifting for me. The amount of the restrictions that have been placed on them, they're singing on balconies. And every day at 6pm, you know, Italy is singing. And I said in the UK that wouldn't happen. That would be swearing across the the street at everybody. It wouldn't be singing that went on. Oh, yeah. I can imagine it now. (laughs) Sharp! Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to recreate the Italy film. No, that that won't happen in the UK. But, well, I hope it does in a way because it's... um, you, you, people are still trying to connect and unite whilst in isolation. And I think that's a really positive um, thing. Yeah, you yeah. know, I think that's an absolutely amazing thing. Um, but it is unfolding daily and we'll see, you know, it is impacting people's lives. It is a worry, but try and keep keep it in perspective and, and keep it real and not panic. That, that was what I really wanted to say to, to our listeners, really. Um, but you can still, you know, if you are isolated, hey, you've got some great listening material on PA UK, right? Absolutely. Right. There's yep. loads of shows on here that you can listen to. Yeah, catch and up. And learn so much. Exactly. It's good, you know, it might give us all a chance to actually uh, get loads of jobs done that we haven't had a chance to get done because our day-to-day lives are so busy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I do think they need to listen to the Paranormal Concept Show first. Well, of course, of course. Yeah. Just put it on a continual loop. That's all you need. A continual loop. Absolutely. (laughs) Most definitely. Tonight's show, we're we're joined a little bit later um, by a special guest talking about the subject that we're going to be discussing, which is haunted highways and byways. Yeah, we've actually changed the topic of the show because we were going to talk about... um, another concept tonight but when we started looking at that we were like oh my god <laughs> so we'll, we'll do it but we, we want to get that right we want to get that um the cosmic egg we want to look at which we advertised last week we want to get that um locked down properly um and absolutely and um, yeah. so we've changed what we were going to talk about um for the show tonight but we've like yeah said, I, I mean we, we did have a cosmic egg but richard had it with his breakfast yesterday so we had to change the show 
And yeah, I, very I, nice scramble. <laughs> and I nearly choked on a cosmic cream egg <laughs> the other day. So, you know. <laughs> you must un- I, um, only have about um, a half dozen of those left now, Kerry. Is that I, I, right? Yeah, we are getting into panic stages if I can't get my chocolate, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> no more toilet roll for you. It's chocolate all the way. <laughs> I'll be like, I'll just use a flannel. It's fine, but I need my chocolate. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so we're talking about haunted highways and byways. Now, guys, you two go out on a lot of road trips. You love a road trip, don't you? Yeah, we do. Yes, it has been rumoured, yes. Yeah, the, the infamous paranormal concept road trip, um, which you can catch up on all the antics that the lads get up to over on our Facebook group page, The Paranormal Concept Show. Um, but they, they, you get out so much um, going across the country um, to various places have you yeah. ever witnessed or experienced anything strange on the roads yourselves? Uh, not actually sort of travelling from location to location. Uh, we've been very fortunate to sort of like visit locations which we've been invited to, to stay over in. And uh, we've uh, possibly had a few sort of like experiences in these locations but uh actually in transit uh i, I actually can't think of anything uh, can you paul no no I, I don't think we have experienced anything like like that um but you know never say never we're, I'm, I'm sure at some stage we might um especially if we go to some of the lo- locations that we're going to be talking about tonight um so yeah i mean I, i've never experienced anything um although the other night i was dropped off um outside my my where i live and um i i was talking to the driver and every so often i just got this feeling that someone was standing by the car sort of behind me so i kept looking and out the corner of your eye it just looked like someone was standing there but when you give it full attention there was no one there Oh, right, I see. I mean, there is one incident which was not all that long ago, and I think it may have been when I was uh, coming back from a road trip or from an investigation. It was very early in the morning, and there's a long hill up into my village, which you have to drive up. And uh, I was driving up, and this was about four, must have been about three or four o'clock in the morning. And uh, coming down the footpath uh, was a uh, a woman, uh, a black woman in in like full type sort of traditional African sort of dress, just walking down the side of the road. Mm. And uh, I thought it was odd at the time, but it was so real. You know, and my sort of way of thinking is that was actually somebody just walking down the side of the road. Mm. Yeah. But who knows? Well, yeah, I mean, I've I've had something like that as well. We was... um on an event at Hadley Castle and we was waiting um, where all the cars come down to park and um, me and my brother was actually sitting in the car um, waiting for the guests to arrive and a guy walked past in full um, World War One military uniform <laughs> and uh... both me and my brother looked at each other and was like you saw that, didn't you? That it was real, would it? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. We used to get a few funny looks, as you guys know. I used to do a reenactment, battle reenactment. Yeah. And uh, there was a few late nights when we used to go out and about in our full regalia, sort of armour, the lot. And uh, yes, we used to play a few pranks on the. Uh, down dark country roads, sort of just walking along. And uh, you used to get a few funny looks as the cars used to drive past. But <laughs> And there gets born an urban legend of the Civil yeah. War soldier walking yeah. down the road. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, there is a place we've all been to that has a renowned history of um, a haunting, which is Hangman's Hill in Epping Forest. Yep, I've been there. Yeah. I I haven't actually been there, but I'll let you two sort of discuss that. Well, this one ties in quite nicely with our last previous shows on the Gallows and Newgate, because Hangman's Hill was allegedly supposed to be a place where they hung people, right? You know, the hanging tree kind of scenario. Um, And it's not that big a hill, I would say. No, no, the, the, the road isn't that long. 
it is only a short bit of road, but... Well, what they say is as you go up it, it feels like you're not going up, you're going down. No, what, what, they, say, what they say is you um, park at the... You stop at the bottom of the hill and then you take your handbrake off and you'll start rolling uphill. Hmm. But is this true, Paul? It is true, but... <laughs> the, 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 but the, big, the big but. <clears throat> it's, it's actually an optical illusion because the road is actually going down and because of the way the bank of the road is... Um, it looks like it's a hill going up, but it isn't. It's actually going down. Um, it's, it's just a lay of the land type of situation. Um, so it is an optical illusion. So you're actually rolling downhill, not up. But because of the sides of the road, um, it appears to you that you are actually rolling uphill, but you're not. That sounds really cool. So that's debunked. There is a couple of other places around the world that does that. Um, I, I do vaguely remember seeing one of these documentaries on TV. There's a place in the, in the US that um, crosses a railway line. And it's exactly the same thing. Um, but obviously their, their legend on it was basically someone got hit by the train. And it now lures people towards the train track. Um but it is the same principle. You're actually rolling downhill, and because of the sides of the roads, it gives you that optical illusion. Hmm. Well, that's something we're definitely going to have to try, Paul. We'll have to get the mystery uh, mobile out and uh, yeah. head over to Epping Forest and hopefully catch some video of this. That that wouldn't be too much of a problem. It's, oh, it's it is a great little area that you know that particular area because there's a really great little church that we've had some experiences in and then there's a lay by which is supposed to be a link to gangland uh, murders and stuff like that but the hills you're talking about in particular actually got a name they're called gravity hills or magnetic hills this phenomena yeah. is well known for that um and it is a fascinating thing isn't it i mean I think the worst experience I've had was coming back from an investigation. And when you're coming back from an investigation, you, it's always a weird one, isn't it? Because you're tired and, you know, you've been hyped up throughout the evening and it's late at night and there was this fog that came down. It was thick as anything, this fog. And for some reason, the sat-nav had taken us through the country roads. So we was driving through fields and it was really heavy laying on the um, thing. And as the mist is moving, it's... Paradolia is coming in... Oh, all the time because the shapes yep. of the headlights on the fog you're seeing shapes and stuff in the fog and it's really the strangest thing in the world driving through the country isolated engulfed by this thick fog with you know your headlights shining off off the fog and it's moving yeah. it is really weird but we did see a guy walking his dog which freaked us right out <laughs> in the middle of the night this was probably about four o'clock in the morning i was like what the hell is he doing walking his dog at that time of the morning <laughs> probably just completely normal could be i don't know um a games keeper or you know it's that kind of environment that area you know the country area could be a, a poacher even you know it could be someone like that yeah. who's like literally out and about, and it's their normal routine. But for us, that freaked us right out. But other than that, I don't think I've had any other experiences. Um, but travelling on roads at specific times can be incredibly evocative. Um, because I remember a time we was going down to Somerset and we'd left um, to do it overnight to avoid the traffic, the majority of the traffic. And as yeah. we came into um, Somerset, we were just about to go past Stonehenge. And as we hit Stonehenge, the sun was literally just coming up. And I, I remember it so distinctly because at the time on the radio, Telegraph Road by Dire Straits was playing. Oh. And it sneaky. was just so, it was like one of those perfect moments in time that you get. Like <laughs> on a deserted road, the sun coming up, Stonehenge is on, on my right, you know, travelling forward. And it was just so, I just remember it so evocatively. And travelling is can create those moments in a way that nothing else can create. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think you're sort of like, you know, as you know, we do the road trips and stuff, and it's it's half the fun is actually 
traveling to the destination you know actually getting out on the open road so to speak it sounds corny but you know i love it exactly and i think that that transitioning isn't it from one place to another really can um i don't know it it just has a a special kind of i think I don't know what the word is. It's, it's, it's almost like a very special transitioning stage when you go through um, things like that, isn't it? Well, yeah, I suppose, you know, we often talk about sort of boundaries and stuff like that in the paranormal. But a roadway, in a way, you know, it's to a destination. There's something, you know, there's a horizon, you know, you're constantly sort of driving towards a horizon or something like that. But it is an evocative sort of sort of thing to be in and uh, um, and to do and and especially at certain times of the day early morning driving mm-hmm. sort of that twilight sort of driving as well is sort of can be quite evocative as well mm, very much so so paul i remember you telling me about a situation that your dad had once <laughs> yeah my dad um used to work on the railway um he was one of the orange army people <laughs> and um yeah, he, he was dry. I think he'd finished a job and he was driving away from the station. There, some stations they've got like a little slip road that goes up um, and then onto the main road. And as he was driving up there, he saw some headlights from behind him um, and tried to undertake him. So he he see them in the mirror, but alongside him was just a bank of of grass and hedges and stuff. Um, so no one could actually get down there, but he he claims that he see this car sort of undertake him into the hedge. But when before it got level with him in the driver's seat, it actually disappeared. It didn't actually materialise. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was, <laughs> that was uh, one of the rural stations in Kent. Oh, right. See, I have to say, the UK has got so much legends and myths surrounding roads, hasn't it? It has. There's so many. Well, we've, you know, there's there's quite a few theories about what causes this um, phenomena and if sort of well sort of occupied or well traveled routes or sort of in the past. I mean, roadways would definitely be at the top of the list, surely. I would think so. I mean, we actually found, when we was looking into this, um, there was so much information on the British roads to do with ghostly tales, you know, than, than there was actually on trains or something like that. And it didn't just mean about people, you know, ghostly apparitions. It, it, it crossed sort of all sorts of things, time slips. It's, it covered um, fairies, black shuck law was, you know, was tied in there, wasn't it? Then there was... Um, actual vehicles not just people it covers like actual ghost vehicles as well which you know yeah that is always interesting to me why an inanimate object would be a ghost as it were you know because that yeah. sort of gives rise to the stone tape theory and those kind of you know scenarios of a recording happening rather than it being an emotional recording of, mm. of an event you know we've talked about that in the last couple of weeks whereas when we started looking at roads, there was like actual apparitions of, of I believe um, you were telling me about a London bus, Paul, that's supposed to. Oh, no, that, that, I think that was Richard that said that. <gasps> yes, oh, there is a London bus and it actually uh, it actually follows a route. I think it's around Kensington, actually. And uh, yeah, it is an old route master, a classic route master red London bus, and that has been reported uh, quite recently, I believe, as well. You know, that is a regular sighting. So there's something, uh, whether there's, and whether people can actually sort of see people on board it or not, I'm not too sure, but it is a London bus that has been reported. Would that be from the, um, like, war period, or is that, do we know what time period that would be? Uh if somebody knew what they were looking at, they could possibly uh, identify, you know, because obviously, you know, buses from the 1940s upwards. But I think you are looking at the classic Route Master double-decker bus would be from about the 
<clears throat> wartime period onwards. So it could be any time between there into the 1960s, right up until the 1980s when the classic route masters were phased out. Yeah. Mm. It's, it is it's, uh, one of those scenarios where you try and... Ex- you know, oh, how can you explain that? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? How do you explain that? Is it how does it get recorded? That's always where I go with things like this. Is if it is a, if it is a recording, how does it get recorded? The mechanics of that, which leads you down a whole pathway of well, physics and yeah. Stuff I mean, like I, I was thinking, I was thinking about this because I, I know obviously you had your theory um, that was an offshoot of the stone tape theory with water memory. Mm, yeah. So I I was thinking along the idea that, I mean, especially with the roads, that there isn't any stone walls or anything like that other than just the, the road. Is there something in the road that could store energy and, um, and memory? Or could it just be the water, water memory? Or is it more down to frequency, vibration and... That side of things, you know, you're driving down the road, you've got friction being built up from the tyres on the road, you've got mm-hmm. the vibration from the car, you know, in particularly if you're travelling at a, a set speed, you know, you're not going up and down yeah. in speed and gears and stuff, <clears throat> which I would think would happen more in America because they have, like, cruise control, don't they, where they, like, sort of, yeah. and their roads yeah. like, long and you stick to one yeah. speed the whole way through um, kind of thing. Um Which is what, actually, when we was looking at alien abduction a little while ago, I was thinking with the um, Barney, the famous initial case of alien abduction, the Barney. Yeah. Oh, the Bet and Barney Hill. Bet and Barney Hill, that's the one, thank you. Um, Was, were they in a specific, it was late at night, they were travelling at a set speed, the vibration, had they sort of induced a self-hypnotic state that then brought something up from their psyche that's very interesting i could actually that works with me you know that sort of and the way you and you've explained it because the process of driving you do it does take a bit of concentration to actually do and uh, you can get into sort of a semi sort of like a hypnotic state because when i drive regular sort of routes routes i'm very used to and stuff like that i will sort of turn up at my destination and i can't remember actually driving there so to yeah speak, that, that's know. quite a common occurrence because mm. i know I've some some other people that do that but i again i i was also thinking um there's a lot of theories out there that claim that time isn't just linear and it's all happening at the same time. Mm. So could we just yeah. be getting glimpses of the past? Yeah, that's another sort of like theory, as you say, Paul, and, you know, plausible, possibly. Yes, I mean, that um, that would make sense in itself, but yeah. it's whether that is the mechanism or not, well, we don't know. No, and, no. and we're just triggering, triggering off a window into the past mm. because of a so set much. set because of a set basis of energy frequency and vibration that's going on that's the trigger you yeah. you know and maybe specific places around um the globe are more susceptible to that i mean going back to the water memory quickly just to cover that when i actually looked deeply into that it is only a theory it's not proved everyone thinks um that there's a famous alleged doctor that came out with that theory um and actually when you look into his credentials they are mm, not he's not actually that he's not got like a phd doctorate he's just bought it from one of these universities that you can do an online course at and it's is emoto his name is dr emoto um it becomes less plausible Credible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It becomes more questionable. And that was because he was selling a product. Yeah. So, you know, to back surprise, up. Surprise. Yeah, and then what's happened is the homeopathy um, people sort of took this and they took one small part of the research and then used that as a basis of facts and scientifically based facts um, to back up their own 
theories in regards to yeah. you know the homeopathy range and then that then led into the paranormal field of well water holds memory and that's why we get a stone tape theory do you know what i mean but this, i don't think the stone tape theory is lacking um legs i think there may be something to it but not one answer i think it's going to be a um if it gets researched and looked at it's a broader spectrum than just water yeah you know what i mean so going into the going back to roads if it's the energy frequency and vibration that allows, whether it be the dimensional slip, the hypnotic state, allowing you to see past the present and into mm-hmm. other realms or something, it, it's still a fascinating case study of different experiences that happen um, on roads across the world. This isn't just like, it's not just the UK. We, fo- we focus on the UK because we're in the UK. But when you, and there is so much information in the UK on this, that you, you know, it, it is so fascinating to me when you look at it. But there are so many different types of roads. You know, when you look at when you have to look at the mechanisms, you've got to start looking at the boring bit, is what I call it. You've got to look yeah. past the ghost story, and you've got to start going right. Okay, each experience, where did it happen on the road? Is it happening at the same place each time? If it is, then what's what's in that environment? So, what's the road made out of? What is the lay of the land? You know, what is. Mm. All of those things, you know, I mean, you have to, you know, what's the environmental conditions, all those sort of things you have to sort of look at to try and get the answers. But that's a case study that would take absolute years to compile all the information to find that that there might not be a pattern. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, because most sort of like, yeah, it would just take uh, the fine, you know, the serious backing that would need to take and dedicated research. I mean, yeah, I can't see anyone, any government or a university wanting to take that on. No, but it might be something that the ghost hunting community could come together with and actually start researching and doing, you know, work on it. But do you think that will happen? I don't think that would happen either, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can dream. Teams, there's, there's too many teams out there that want to keep things secret and... You know, they, they don't want to share their knowledge or experiences and things like that. So it would th- take a huge un- uncoordinated effort. And uh, no, it won't yeah. happen. <laughs> it's I actually, a simple answer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually think it's about secrecy. I actually um, think it's more about they're not want, that's not what they're in the field for. They're out there just to have yeah. that, pers- you know, their personal experience when they do a ghost hunt. Yeah, you that's know, right. It's not not actually, they don't really care about the mechanics and how it happens. How could it possibly happen? Just the experience is enough, which is fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Um, but that's where I get a bit, that's ghost investigating. Don't, don't press it as something it's not. You're, you're, don't call yourself an investigator. <laughs> yeah, because you're, you know, you're, yeah. you're not. You know, what you're, you're doing is you're going out for experiences, which is fine. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. But don't label it something it's not because you're not actually pushing it forward all you're doing is recreating a tv program effectively when you go out um and you're not pushing the field forward you're you're not trying to find the mechanics of why we have this experience and i'm not sitting here saying i i'm doing that either because i'm not but i'm researching and i get my thrill from research as you guys know and i love i do love a good ghost hunt as well but that's not my drive. My drive is more... But it leads it down into the boring the boring thing, isn't it? Like like you say, you know, compiling a spreadsheet of... Take one instance, yeah. say like uh, Barfield Bridge in Northamptonshire. Um, mm-hmm. There's a stretch of bridge that is said to be haunted by a monk that's um, alleged to appear in front of drivers at night. All right Now, this is not just a one incident thing. There's several people have reported this. But to go back, track down every single person to then get that information through to, you know, build your spreadsheet of all the factors. That's only relevant literally seconds after the the event because you forget, don't you? We've talked about this before as well, about false memory and and how your mind changes things. I mean, it was a dark and stormy night and I was driving down the A6003 or whatever it's called. (laughs) And, um, you know, then I saw this monk on the side of the road and, you know, I nearly crashed because of he stepped out in front of me and it wasn't actually a dark and stormy night. It was a bit blustery, but it weren't a stormy night. You know what I mean? And um, 
you know, it, oh, that happened in the middle of November. No, it actually happened in October. Do you know what I mean? Little facts like that, people forget. Yeah, there, there's always discrepancies in any, anyone's witness statement. Um, I mean, any any police officer or anyone like that would would tell you that. You know, you can interview 10 people about the same incident and they'd all come out with a slightly different take on it. Yeah, there's the uh, famous uh, thing. I think, Kerry, you've... Uh, You've seen the uh, YouTube video when they take a group of people around the Area 51 site or yeah. around the outside. Roswell, and, uh, yeah, it was Roswell. And, yeah, and they come across a crashed sort, you know, sort of someone standing there, a military personnel with a gun, loads of wreckage around, and they take the group past and then they interview them all um, individually afterwards of what they actually saw. And uh, it is quite, you know, the discrepancies are quite big. Yeah, massively big. Like one person said, oh, they pointed a gun at us and that hadn't happened because they had it all on video of what actually happened. But the witness statements afterwards did not reflect, um, (laughs) did not reflect (laughs) the the video footage at all. It was quite, some of it was quite way off from the experience that they'd had. And a lot of it was about perception of what they were expecting. You know, they'd go to a Roswell site and there's all that conspiracy theory and and, um, stories about what had happened on the actual incident that happened back in the, what, the 1950s, wasn't it? The Roswell? Yeah, 47, I think, yeah. Yeah, and um, so you you go with like a preconception or preconceived idea and then you get faced with something like that and then all of a sudden your mind is is putting information in that didn't actually happen without you even realising it. So, And this is the problem. So unless you document all of those factors that we were talking about at the point of experience... The further yeah. away from the experience, the less reliable the witness statement. I mean, this is a well-known fact in regards to police investigation, isn't it? Well, yes, yeah. so and this is compounded, I feel, as particularly with uh, paranormal instances because by their very nature, they are usually very fleeting and they don't last long anyway. So uh, that uh, And that also compounds the witness sort of statements, if it is sort of witnessed by more than one person. Totally. Yeah. It so is... as, as, um, as part of an ambulance crew as well, we get it. You know, when you first attend an incident, it's like, OK, so can you tell me what happened? And, you know, you get witness people and if you can talk to the patient as well, you know, you always get this discrepancy. So we're, we're trying to spot like spot that as well and look out for other clues that might not get mentioned. Exactly. So it's something to bear in mind. But anyway, we're going to take a quick break at this point. And when we come back, we have got an amazing author that has researched the highways and byways of Britain. And she wrote, has written a book called The Roadmap of Briti- British Ghosts. Yes, yes you got it, dear. I got it. I, oh, I should have written that bit down. <laughs> <laughs> Which I will have done when we come back after the break. Sure you'll find one. <laughs> Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? And welcome back. Um, we are now joined in the studio by Ruth Roper Wild. Hello, Ruth. Hi, everybody. How are you? Absolutely fine. Just watching this horrible rain come back yet again. Oh, tell me about it. It's terrible, isn't it? Oh, it's sunny, <laughs> sunny where I am at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I've got rays flooding through the window here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ruth, why don't you tell our lovely listeners all about yourself and and where you sit in the paranormal field? Um, Well, so I'm an author that writes about, uh, well, mostly ghosts, but really anything paranormal. Um, I have been writing for about three and a half years, something like that. And I've published four books on the subject now. Um, I 
gotten interested in the subject uh, in my teenage years, really, because I lived in a house with what most people would term as a poltergeist and quite an active one. So things getting chucked about and moved and lights switched on and off and doors banged on and all sorts of things. Um, and it started a lifelong interest in, in what was causing that. So I started reading a lot around the subject and quite quickly discovered that I'd get bored with the same old stories being trotted out. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know whether ghosts were still active or whether anybody else was experiencing the kind of things we were experiencing. Um, so I started a database, uh, which I just built up over the years, of every time I found a story that was modern rather than an old you know, haunted castle with a, a ghost that was seen in 1724 or whatever. Um, and once I finally got to the position in life where I could partially retire in my early 50s, I thought, well, what am I going to do with all this spare time? I'll write that book I always wanted to write. Um, and that's that's where I started, really. So I really wanted to write books which tell us whether or not hauntings are currently active. Um rather than just trot out the same story and mm. actually find out whether there genuinely is something there or whether it was just a one-off and therefore, you know, we can't ever corroborate whether that person did or didn't experience something or whether what they experienced was or wasn't paranormal. Um, so I just started with my database and started going out on social media, basically, asking people, have you had any experiences here, there or whatever, according to, you know, what I had on the database? Um, and I, I've, I've said I've published four books now. So the first one was just about uh, ghosts around where I live because I thought I'd better start with something quite short and um, succinct while I figure out how to do this whole writing a book thing. Um, and that was Ghosts of Marston Vale. Then I decided that the database was so huge that I'd better find another way to split some of the details down. So I wrote Almanac of British Ghosts, which is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a calendar of um, ghosts that, that anniversary haunt, so su supposedly only haunt on one day of the year or, or you know, one particular date, yeah. and that's laid out exactly like a calendar. And then I moved on to another way to split the database, and I wrote Roadmap of British Ghosts, which, again, is exactly what it says on the tin. It's laid out county by county um, and is uh, tales of the ghosts that haunt our roads and byways and lanes and highways um, and what I tried to do with roadmap particularly was find a haunting that was already published somewhere and then go out and find out whether people had actually seen it or not um, or seen something in the same vicinity to give me an eye you know a feeling for whether there was actually some sort of paranormal activity in that particular location so along that particular road or whatever it might be and then I found from that I had so many accounts where people would write back to me and say, well, I didn't see the the ghost along the A6 that you're asking for, but my house that's near there is haunted and tell me their own story about, you know, something close to there. Hmm. So that's where the fourth book, um, These Haunted Times, Volume 1, came from, because that was kind of all the stories that didn't fit into Roadmap went. Um, and it's just, a, for me, it's just the complete fascination of the corroboration of finding more than one person that's seen something in the same location. I get so excited every time I get a corroboration. Yeah, we were talking about this before the break and, and saying, like, that's where it becomes interesting, is where you get more than one account of the same thing happening in the same place. And then why does that happen at that particular point in, in time, at that particular moment, in the same way for everybody? So when you was writing the book... How many accounts did you come across that? Or was it all of them were like same account, same account, same account? Well, fascinatingly, because um, I spent most of my career as um, an investigator of one type or another. So I spent 15 years as a fraud investigator and then 15 years as a bullying, harassment and discrimination investigator. And one of the things you learn when you're doing either criminal investigation or employment law investigation, those two are, is that you must not lead your witnesses. Mm. So you're you're taught to be very careful not to tell them what it is you're looking for. And I follow that principle when I'm going out on social media. So 
I will I will write out I'm looking for anybody who's knows anything about or has experienced a haunting or something paranormal in such and such a location. But I won't tell them what exactly it is that I'm looking for. Because that way, if they come back with the same ghost or the same type of experience that I'm looking for, then I get wildly excited that I've got a, a direct corroboration. But what really started to fascinate me is I find that I get an awful lot of accounts come back for that location that aren't the same thing that people are seeing. And they're not necessarily, you know, one might have seen uh, an unusual light down that road. One might have heard something weird down that road. One might have seen something weird and somebody else might have seen something, but it was totally different to what the first person saw. And that just becomes even more fascinating because then you start to think, right, so rather than an actual apparition of, for example, you know, a tall man wearing a hat, Mm. have we actually got here something that triggers paranormal responses in people? Or does it trigger something in the people's brains that they think they hear or see something or is there something there that's presenting itself in a different way and I get lost in my own head in all the hundreds of different theories you could apply to that but to me it always comes back to nevertheless all these people had some sort of experience in this location why um and even after you know all this time researching and the books I've written and the the one I'm currently writing number five I still find myself sitting on the fence. I still don't have a firm belief in one theory or another of my own because for all the data that I collect, for me, it always comes back to, I think there's more than one explanation and I think there's more than one type of phenomena and I don't think you can pigeonhole it into one or another. I think it has to, you know, you have to accept that when somebody finally figures out all this data, it's going to be a case of, there's all sorts of different phenomena and somebody will one day figure out the scientific behind it. Yeah. Well, that's funny enough. We were saying that, and but it's getting that experience as almost like on the ground, on the ground as it happens, isn't it? And because memory changes things and, you know, belief systems are so changeable across the cultures, you know, it, it's so difficult to pin it down to what actually happened at that moment in time to get the data that's needed to to understand the mechanics of it. Absolutely. And to sort out urban myth and misreporting, um, it, because all that plays a factor as well. I mean, one of the things I quickly found, um, you know, with doing the research is you'll find a published story that repeats the same details over and over. And when when you actually look into it, one of the basic details is completely wrong. Mm. Um, Mm. And yet everybody's just endlessly repeated it as a a myth, um, you know, or as the account. So for an example of that, you know, I found several accounts about Holcomb in Devon um, and a stretch of road that was haunted by... Um, a middle-aged gentleman who would try and flag cars down by waving a torch. And you can find various versions of that account um, in all sorts of, you know, articles, books, online, whatever. Uh, But one of the things you quickly notice is that they give the name of the witness and yet her name changes in different accounts. So you start to think, hello. Um, And... Then I found some that said, well, actually, you know, this was all in 19... They all tend to say it was in the early 1970s or 1973. Then you find a bunch of accounts that actually there was also a lorry driver who encountered it back in the 1950s. And he saw it several times and eventually he refused to stop. And this time the ghost sort of threw itself in front of his lorry and nearly caused him to crash. But when I really started looking into it, what I discovered was the piece of road they're talking about is not by Holcomb in Devon at all it's by Holcomb in Somerset near Wellington it's a completely different stretch of road in a different county and when you then go out and ask the people who live around there what do you know about this stretch of road you suddenly get an awful lot of responses about people who've seen the figure of a man stepping out into the traffic um, sometimes carrying what looked like a lantern rather than a torch 
Mm. Um, and you start to think, well, this is how things get so confused over time and how you end up with urban myths, because somehow at some point in time, somebody's mistranscribed that and, and ascribed it to Holcomb in Devon. When in it's, actual it's fact, bit, it's near it's Wellington like in Somerset. Paul? I oh, said so it's a bit like Chinese whispers. Yes. Yes, very yeah. much like that. Yes. And it, and it can be quite hard unravelling that sometimes. In fact, the only reason I managed to unravel that one was because they all kept referring to this particular hotel, which over the years has changed its name, which, of course, made it even more difficult to track it down. But when I finally tracked down what hotel they were talking about, that clearly wasn't in Devon. It was in Somerset. Um, yeah. And that's when I suddenly realised that there was another tiny village called Holcombe near where this hotel is. And I thought, well, that's that's the actual real Holcombe then. And the tiny village is actually called Holcombe Rogus. And somehow people have transcribed that then to be Holcombe in Devon. Ah. Uh, so people are sort of like hearing of this story and sort of miss sort of identifying it as a totally different location. And here comes the paranormal mutt. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah, he's decided to wake up. <laughs> decided, I'll just mute my mic while you guys carry on, <laughs> while he settles down. <laughs> yeah, so do, do you ever get like, um, have you experienced like the power of suggestion with um, some of the roads? Like, for example, um, you've got the, place near bolton which is like the devil's highway they it's locally known as it's the a666 have you ever right. come across that one um without checking my database it's not ringing a bell off the top of my head but there are literally hundreds of entries on my database um so it's not ringing any particular bell for the moment yeah and no, i just wonder whether or not like with with that one because it's called the a666 People would also assume it's like um, demonic, uh, and it, there have yeah. been like obviously a number of apparent sightings there um, uh, of a shadowy figure crossing the road. And uh, I just of course, wonder whether or not, of, yeah, because, yeah, because of the six 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 connection. No, I'm yeah. just talking. Actually, I was just opening the database while you were talking, and no, I haven't got that one. I have oh. got the A six seventy five by Bolton. Okay. Well, there are, look, but we found this, didn't we? When we had a quick look around, um, looking at different hauntings on roads and stuff, and it was only a quick internet search, so we're not nowhere near yeah. as well researched as you. Um, there's a plethora, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories um, across the whole of the, you know, the whole of the British Isles about haunted roads. How did you manage to distill it down into um, your book? <laughs> um, well, the book ended up being a bit bigger than I intended. Um, <laughs> for one thing, <laughs> for exactly that's that not a reason. bad thing. That's not a bad and, thing. <laughs> and curiously, um, I ended up trying to include the ones that I had something for. There are some in there that I couldn't find anything for that I've included just for the sake of completeness. But what I tried to do is only include the ones where I'd actually found some sort of corroboration for. So on the database, there's still dozens and dozens more roads that aren't yet in the book. Um, and obviously, you know, I published Roadmap in, I think it was December 2018. Um, and since then, I've done um, published These Haunted Times. And while people are writing to me in response to my social media questions about that book, I'm picking up yet more road ghost stories. So adding them to the database and thinking, oh, this writing, I'll have to do a roadmap. Two. Volume two as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just goes on and on and on. Um, and it's, you know, I, I dread the day when my database can't cope with the amount of data anymore. Oh, bless <laughs> you. It just gets bigger and bigger. Um, but yes, there. I mean, there are just so many different accounts of ghosts on our roads. And what fascinates me about it is people, I, I get a lot of sceptics, obviously who, you know, don't believe in ghosts, don't believe in the paranormal. And particularly because I go out on social media, I occasionally pick up somebody, you know, who answers the posts with quite derogatory mark remarks or is quite nasty or whatever. Yeah. And one of the things they most commonly um, accuse the those who believe in the paranormal of is 
of course there's no such thing as ghosts if there were ghosts they'd haunt all the time not just at night you know and i always respond to that read my books a huge proportion of the sightings are in broad daylight yeah yeah you know this That's sort of, of the... notion that ghosts only come out at night is just a popular notion it's not backed up by the data most people will see ghosts at any time of day or night well, um yeah this is really this... ghost hunting in daylight myself you know because I've learned that, well, it doesn't matter whether it's day or night, I'm still just as likely to see anything. So I might as well go and have a nice picnic and take the dogs for a walk while I'm looking. <laughs> well, this Why is not? something we've always said, you know, when we go out and do our road, you know, the road trips around, you know, our area and stuff like that. We never go at night. It's always during the daytime because, like you say, it's, it's going to happen just as much in the day as, as it is at night. And you could do some of the experiments. The only difference is there might be other people around that you have to be aware of. You know, that's, that's the only difference. Um, I think that perception has actually come out of like the paranormal TV shows of where they're like locked down at night and it's scary location, hunting ghosts. I think that's where that perception that you've got to do it at night has come from. And the only place it's come from is that um, because of lack of contamination from other people and, you know, the roads are quieter and stuff like that. So I think that's the only place that that's come from, because like you say, experiences happen, you know, all the time, not just at night time. And it's important to remember that. And we, we kind of prefer the daytime, don't we, lads? Oh, well, yeah. we do. Absolutely. <clears throat> and we've got better things done to do at night, like sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get, get a nice early night, especially yeah. at our age. Getting too old for these cold, dark, damp places in the middle of the night. <laughs> but even with, even with like private paranormal investigations, like people's houses and things, I always like to get them to do like a, um, a diary of what happens and when so if for example i don't know something happens every day at three o'clock in the afternoon i can pick that up and then go okay well we need to do the afternoon investigation you know and and try and limit the amount of time we're there to try and get that evidence yeah there's no point doing it but, midnight if it's happening at three uh, o'clock in the afternoon is it you know absolutely so ruth what was one of the um most strangest stories you came across whilst researching um the highways well i was particularly sad not to be able to get any corroboration for this one um i would have loved to have found somebody who'd actually seen it but there is a road that is haunted by a bag of soot really <laughs> brilliant oh, <that laughs> Please tell. And that just makes me chuckle every single time. Um, and it's uh, it's in near Crowborough, and it's a road called Walsh's Road, and it is allegedly haunted by a bag of soot that chases people. It chases people. <laughs> we so need to do a road trip there, Richard. <laughs> oh, we're, we're going. I've got the map out already. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly. When I looked into, um, you know, that whole uh, story, and it is in the book, is there seems to be a story as well of the ghost of a rag and bone man along that lane okay. um, driving his horse and cart. I mean, you have to be of a certain age and older to remember rag and bone men. Mm-hmm. But they used to ride round on old carts with usually a you know sort of a big dray horse of some type pulling it yeah and they would literally ride up and down the streets ringing a bell shouting rag and bone and you used to take out anything that was for trash for them so rather than taking things to tidy tips like we do today you used to wait for the rag and bone man to come round and you know you'd put your old you know wash tub or um you know waste items your old chairs whatever on the back of his car and he'd take it away and obviously they made a living from it and this same lane is haunted by the ghost of the rag and bone man in his cart and horse um supposedly seen in 1977 um and it does make me wonder whether that has again become a bit of an urban myth where somebody's kind of transmuted that over time into a haunted bag of soot because of course bags of coal and coal men would deliver on the same type of horse and cart yeah it does make you wonder whether there's some sort of connection between you know the one story and the other 
Yeah, it's, it's almost like, again, with the Chinese whispers, it's gone from a rag and bone man to a, a Coleman, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Or people would have got, well, back in the day when when a lot of people would have had coal fires and everything, you would have had a lot of soot and embers left over and uh, perhaps rag and bone men would collect them as well. Who knows? I'm sure they probably did. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure they probably did. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a connection between those two stories. But, yeah, it always makes me giggle, that one, the, the haunted bag of soot. <laughs> and if anybody's seen it, please, please, please contact me. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. It'd be great to get some corroboration on that one, wouldn't it? Mm. <laughs> now, it's not just people um, that haunt going into inanimate objects. I mean, a bag of soot is like not something you'd expect to chase you down the road. But... Um, there's loads and loads of accounts of haunted vehicles, isn't there, that have, dis- you know, you see them and they disappear. What sort of accounts did you find on those? Well, there are two that spring to mind particularly. Um, there's one on the Isle of Skye, which is a very famous one. Um, there's a, a vintage old car that drives around the Isle of Skye and is seen all the time. Um, and when I wrote out about that, I, I had so many people contacting me who over the years of of, because obviously they're very tiny um windswept remote roads on the isle of sky yeah and you know in a lot of places they're single lane only and there's passing places so if you're driving them after dusk and people have got their headlights on and you see a pair of headlights coming down the moor side or the mountainside towards you and you're near a passing space obviously you pull in and wait for the other vehicle to come by um and I've, I've got I had so many people contact me who had done exactly that and waited for the vehicle. Um, and it's just never a, appeared. Um, it's just no vehicle passes them. That that must be interesting because I've actually been to Sky and uh, that is quite evocative because I know exactly sort of like the roads and this stuff. One, and, but it seems yeah. to, the other one that I got really interested in was the haunted lorry. Um, 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 seems on the Edfordshire right through Warwickshire and even up past Birmingham you can find little accounts of it now, I can't say for certain it's the same lorry but there seems to be a sort of line of haunted lorry stories that go across those counties in little yeah. pockets so my suspicion is it's the same lorry and it actually haunts a very long stretch of road yeah, interesting because uh, they would have been, we would have travelled long distances as well. Yeah, absolutely, and they, you know, very probably had the same route that it did over and over and over again. Um, yeah. You know, but, but, but how the vehicles end up becoming part of a haunting? I mean, is that time slip? Is that um, stone tape theory? I don't know. Um, mm. It, it doesn't make you wonder. I get a lot of horses as well get an awful lot of horses or horse and carts on roads but then when you think how long um you know before the car was invented centuries and centuries of horse travel mm-hmm. around the country that's not really surprising when you think about it no we've always talked in the paranormal field about connection um uh, having or being able to have a connection to something and, and as humans we intrinsically need connection to people um we base a lot of our own self-worth and validation on how we connect to other people and stuff but back in the day we would have had that connection to animals in a lot stronger way that we would have had that we have nowadays um other than you know your pet cat or dog or bird or whatever it is that you've got nowadays but horses and um, would have been an intrinsic part of life integral to your well-being of earning money for your family um so that connection to to livestock is less a lot less now than it would have been back in the day so i can understand that connection um to a horse you know people would have been very connected to their horse and cart you know like i say because it would have been so integral to their day-to-day living um so horse the horse and cart i mean i've even got one of those stories on canvey of a horse and cart that drove into the lake and the woman who was driving it drowned and she's now known as the white lady of the lake um everybody (laughs) in you know never seen it myself lived on the island for quite a few years but it it is an integral part how much links into the folklore of the place you know like tales of fairies and and those kind of tales 
Um, I haven't actually really looked into too much about that side of the folklore um, because I haven't spent too much trying to find the correlation between, say, fairies or angels or UFOs. Mm. But you do get some areas that you think, actually, there seems to be an awful lot this outside of kind of my bit of the paranormal, as I like to think of it, you know, sort of ghosts and and kind of more that side. So, for example, the road um, that runs just below Bella Snap, um, you know, Bella Snap is uh, a Neolithic site and there's a road that runs through the woodside, a wooded hillside just below it. And that's got various tales of haunting on it. And I've certainly got an account of somebody seeing a strange light move down through the woods and across the road at speed. Um, and that makes you you think in terms of, well, I wonder, you know, these days, if somebody sees a strange light, for example, in the woods, they're going to think in terms of UFO, mm -hmm. because that's kind of what's in our modern parlance and in our modern cultural thinking. Mm. But if you went back a couple of hundred years and somebody recounted seeing a strange light in the woods, the cultural reference then is much likely to have been either angel or fairy or witch or it's going to have been more along those lines. Yeah. So I often think that it's what happens is that the um, the reference point changes, but what's happening doesn't change. So it's still a strange light moving through the woods. It's just that people are interpreting it differently when they see it. And we still don't actually know what the strange light is. And that's the part that, that really fascinates me um, about collecting the data, because I, you know, I always say it'll, it won't be me that comes up with the answers of what, what's actually causing this. My role, I've always seen it as, is to collect the data and put it down for posterity, which is kind of what my books are doing. Yeah. Um, for somebody else to be able to come along, have the data there at their fingertips in the book, and then make the links to be the actual brainiac who makes the links and finally figures out what it is. Because I really do think that um, it's exactly that, the cultural reference changes. So it's not, the question isn't, are there fairies or are there ghosts or are there angels or whatever, it, you know, interpretation, UFO, whatever. Yeah. The question is, what is that mm. strange light in the woods? And sooner or later, somebody will have enough data to be able to figure that out. And a well, good example well, of that, I think, is Black Shucks. Yes. Yeah, here we go. Because, yeah. uh, you know, those of us who like to read about the paranormal and some will all know what a Black Shuck is. But if you if you talk in modern parlance you know sort of you know to your, your friends outside of the paranormal world if you like it's a term that's fallen out of use very much and and you know your general populace going about their business wouldn't recognize the term necessarily now those of us interested in the paranormal all know it's a large demonic type black dog often seen, said to be about the size of a calf often said to have glowing eyes often said to be a harbinger of doom and haunts you know, roads and, and fields in remote places. Now, prior to doing the research for Roadmap of British Ghosts, I had, like I presume many other people, had thought that the, the black shuck phenomena was kind of rooted firmly pretty much in the Middle Ages and a little bit later in British history. Um, much to my astonishment, they're alive and kicking um, yeah. and still being sighted on our roads today. And that led me on to think, well, actually, I wonder how many of the big cat sightings you sometimes see in the newspaper are actually black shucks. But people yeah. are interpreting what they saw as something that they know about. So they saw a large black animal that they know isn't native to this country. You know, it wasn't a fox. It wasn't a badger. Um, it wasn't somebody's pet dog. Um, so they're interpreting it in terms of it must be an escaped zoo animal now. Yeah. Whereas historically, they interpreted it in terms of, oh, it's that black shuck, you know, that the legends are about. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there is still sightings of some large black or, you know, dark coloured shaggy creature wandering our byways right. and highways still. Equally, and remote though, it, it goes the other way around as well. 
for how many of the Black Shuck stories could actually be accounted for by um, one of these big black cats or whatever the whatever they are now. Well, yeah, absolutely. It could go the other way. I mean, there springs to mind that village in Suffolk somewhere. I completely forget off the top of my head which village it is. But that had um, legends of a ghost dog that protected the village for many centuries. And the story was, was that, that... Wasn't that a Bungay? Bungay? I, th- I think it might have been, yes. I think yeah. it might be right. And they did eventually find the skeleton. Yeah. Um, of a huge wolf-type dog yeah, breed in a grave you know which tended to suggest that there was some truth to the legend yeah, d- that they didn't had they had. say didn't they say it was more like um the great dane type yeah of like an irish wolfhound or yeah or dane, yeah, yeah great dane remember. type yeah but yeah. um you know it but it tends to make you think well there, there's some grain of truth in that whole myth yeah so yes it, you know it could exactly be the other way around um you know, I've got a couple of accounts where uh, people saw what they thought was quite honestly a werewolf running alongside the road. In fact, one person saw one dragging an Alsatian away. Um, so, you know, maybe they're not black shucks at all. Maybe they're we're back into the realm of the paranormal with with werewolf or or whatever. And that, for me, again, is the endless fascination because you bounce backwards and forwards. And this is why when I said earlier. I don't believe there's one explanation fits all. Yeah. I think it's going to turn out to be that actually there's several different explanations for several different type of phenomena. Yeah. And it's a case of unravelling all those threads to find out which is which. Well, that, that's it. I mean, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, although I don't believe in like the whole traditional uh, werewolf type of stories, um, one story that did interest me was... A, a local one actually from me in South End. There was a guy that walked into a police station in the eighties, I think it was eighty four, and he basically said, like, can you lock me up because I'm a danger to society and he claimed to be a werewolf. And he actually had a scuffle with the policeman and that you know, you could you could still talk to the Serbian officers now. Um and he had extraordinary strength. And it took like twelve of them to actually subdue him. Um, I, I don't know exactly. I, I, I do believe the um, the Warrens got involved with that case. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because again, you know, I know there are some types of drug that give people strength, yeah. aren't there? Apparent strength, you know. So, could you interpret that as he was high on some type of drug, and that made him believe? Well, aware. absolutely. Um, I, mean, I, I think I think the media went with like um, the, the South End werewolf. I think. <laughs> <laughs> as, as the media would, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Still, you know, that, again, you can think of the fact is, if you've got a number of policemen who are able to corroborate that happened that day, yeah. You always come back to my point that whatever interpretation you put on it, or turns out to be the truth when somebody finally unravels it. The fact still remains that that was a person with superhuman strength mm-hmm. who believed he had the potential to be a danger to people. Yeah, there's yeah. the basic fact behind that story. Absolutely. And and so for me, it's about gathering those facts where I can. Yeah. Albeit, I know some people would dispute that witness testimony is fact, but that's, I'm afraid that's all you're going to get in this realm. Mm. Um, yeah. Then uh, to sort of build from that. And try and, like I say, follow the threads, try to unravel it, try to see what that comes up with. Yeah, it's a fascinating account in in Roadmap of somebody who saw um, something that could be described as a bit kind of werewolf-like, depending on, a bit like the ones when they looked in the Harry Potter films. Yeah. Um, And she was responding to my query about a particular stretch of road that's supposed to be haunted by the figure of a black monk or a monk wearing a black habit yeah the moment i went out on social media although i did my normal being careful not to mention what exactly i was looking for immediately the responses started coming back oh you're talking about the black monk that haunts that road so it was obviously a really well-known legend in that area yeah but this particular 
lady wrote back to me and said, well, actually, I have seen something along that road. Um, and it was only afterwards that I heard the legends of the black monk. Um, but what I saw was clearly not a monk. And she remembered that it'd been about 10 years ago on bonfire night because they were on their way to a bonfire party, which is how yeah. she remembers when, you know, what night it was. And it would have been about seven o'clock in the evening, but obviously already dark in November. And she and her husband were new to the area and had been invited out to this bonfire party and were driving down this particular road, which was a small lane and had high hedgerows on either side, really thick ones that, you know, with a bit of a bank. Yeah. You couldn't easily get through. And all of a sudden, right in front of the car, loped out of one of these hedgerows, a, a humanoid shape entity, whatever, mm. of six or seven feet tall, with unnaturally long arms and feet, not wearing any clothing, not covered in fur or anything, just appeared to be hairless, um, and was loping across the road in in the cone of their headlight beam from the car. Mm. The husband slammed the anchors on. The car, obviously the, the front nose dipped on the car and the sort of brakes squealed a little bit. That attracted the attention of the creature, which turned to look at the car, yeah. Um, and then turned to look forward again and carry on across the road and lope through the hedge on the other side. So the whole incident only lasted a few seconds. But she said, well, the thing that stuck with her all these years is the way it so slowly turned its head to look at them and then slowly turned its head back again, almost as if it was behaving robotically yeah. whilst maintaining its forward lope. And the fact that she to this day, can't understand how it was stepping through the hedgerow when the hedgerow is too thick for anything to go through. And she says, to this day, her husband won't discuss the incident because it scared him so much and he's got no explanation of what they saw that he's just not talking about it. Just not talking about it. She says, so I don't know what that road is haunted by, really, but it wasn't a black monk that we saw. Yeah. Um, so who knows? Again, back to the, I wonder if it's the road itself that has some sort of attraction, some sort of um, ability to spark events to happen, and and the stories grow up around that, rather yeah. than actually being the ghost of a black monk or whatever. Yeah. Do Do you think maybe that it's not a haunting as such, but more of a a, a crypto or cryptoid um, that's in that area that was just start walking along that road one night entirely possible yeah i mean other people would tell you oh it's probably an alien <laughs> um you know yeah. whatever it was they saw something um and it, it just endlessly fascinating again to me as to well Absolutely. whatever explanation you choose <laughs> there's still something there wasn't there yeah Oh, it's like the stories of the um, black-eyed children in um, Cannock. Yeah, Cannock yes. shows. We was there the other day, weren't we, Paul? And yeah, yeah, we took it, a trip out there. And it's certainly sort of like, again, you know, quite a sort of like a, the road cuts through the middle of the chase. So if there's anything going to happen, you can certainly imagine something strange happening around there. I mean, yeah. it's qu- quite a, you know, quite an evocative place again. I think we only passed a few cyclists, but that was about it. Yeah, we didn't manage to get them, though, did we? I missed them. No, you did. You missed them, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> no points there, then. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was the creeps, the thought of black-eyed children ghosts. I must admit, that's one of the ones that really creeps me out. They're not yeah. nice characters, are they? When you when you look at the mythology surrounding. The black-eyed children, they're a bit freaky. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, we, we, I did say to Richard that we, we did pass uh, one child on a bike and I said we should pull him over and just see if he's... Just say to him, have you got black eyes? And if he says, no, do you want some? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But no, no. What are you like? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way he's passing the bike there, Ruth. <laughs> So going back to um, the highways and byways, what was the most famous case you looked at? 
Um, I guess it's probably in terms of most well known is probably the car which that well that's a haunted car again but there's a car which was seen by several drivers and it they reported it in one night to the police all through that course of the night um supposedly where it's a bit of a dual carriageway and they all thought that they they were all reported that they'd seen a car come the other way that had suddenly skidded across the road and gone off the edge of the dual carriageway and down a steep embankment. Um, so the police rushed out there and started searching for this crashed car. And they searched for quite some time. And, you know, they gradually widened their search along this verge of quite a steep embankment down into sort of brush like trees and undergrowth and they eventually found the car about 100 yards away from where people had been saying they'd been reporting it through this this particular night but when they found it the car was actually about 10 years old i can't quite remember but quite some years old and the accident had actually happened years before and yet somehow it was being reported on this particular night yeah and it solved a, a an age old missing persons case um, because they found gruesomely they found the skeleton of the driver a few yards up the bank from the car where it looked like he'd survived the crash and tried to drag himself up the bank to presumably you know go and flag for help but didn't make it. Yeah. Presumably his injuries had been too severe or whatever. Um, and he'd actually been reported as a missing case some years earlier but they'd never even been looking for him in that county because he was from somewhere in south london i forget where now Tottenham or somewhere um and they they haven't been able to figure out what he was doing along that stretch of road he was a bit of a petty criminal um so you know he may well have been up to something nefarious that night which is why nobody knew where he was that night um or where to look for him when he then went subsequently went missing um, but obviously, you know, for whatever reason, he'd actually crashed the car some years earlier and had died and the car had remained hidden. Um, and then it was seen by all these people who, who reported it on one particular night. But it it, it, it resulted in the, the car being found. Yeah, so very... that's pretty, pretty much average response time from the police then. Scathing, <laughs> oh, scathing. <stopping, laughs> <scathing. laughs> Uh, no, I would, I would have thought it'd be a case of that if if he's missing, if he was reported missing in London, for example, they wouldn't put out a national search for him. No, yeah. and they they like, done due diligence and looked around, you know, for him and his car, um, yeah. where he was known to to be to be in his various locations. But this particular roadway was, it wasn't even anywhere that his family or anything knew he would be likely to be. It was some yeah. miles away. Like yeah, in county. So, um, and you know he disappeared and his car had disappeared and, and nobody had ever known what had happened to him and, and, and then it turned out that he'd have been in this crash that's quite yeah, sad really, isn't, isn't, isn't it isn't it? Yeah. it does make you wonder why all of a sudden this one night years and years later several people saw that saw the crash an anniversary haunting or something maybe which actually crosses over into your almanac of British ghosts, <laughs> doesn't it, really? <laughs> there is this crossover, though, um, between reoccurring hauntings and, you know, hauntings on, on the highways. What was the one that you found was the biggest version of that, as it were, that reoccurred on a specific road at a specific time? Well, I didn't find any that were specific times on roads. No. Uh, but I did find one... That, that was really interesting for how many corroborations I got for it. Um, and that was the lanes around a small village in North Bedfordshire called Risley. Mm -hmm. And um, the published story that you can, you know, find anywhere was, I think was from about the 1980s, judging, you know, by the way it's written when it's published elsewhere. 
that a farmer working on the corner of what Eastfield Road corner, which is a bit hard to actually locate when you come to uh, look for it, but various people in the village seem to think it's on along a particular stretch of road outside the village. And he was working on the side of the road on the verge um, in the, doing some work on the ditch and hedge that you know were on the edge of his land when he heard the sound of a horse galloping towards him. So he, he sort of stood upright from where he'd been bent over, you know, working on the hedge and it and sort of looked up and the noise crashed through the hedge right next to him and on down the road, but there was nothing to be seen. So I'd written out and asked whether people had, um, you know, any experience of that. Uh, well, n not of the ghost. I would just asked for hauntings along this road and didn't mention that it was a horse I was interested in. Um, and somebody wrote back to say that in February 2000, um, one afternoon, she and her husband were out walking their dog um, in the lanes around Risley. And they'd been in, they live in Risley and they've been intending to do a sort of circular route with the dog where they walked along some of the lanes and then cut across the fields and sort of back round and into the village and home. Um, but one bit where they were walking along the lane still they were actually walking alongside the field that they were then intending to cut across but there was a high hedge separating them from the field and all the time they were walking along the side of this hedge on the roadside with their dog they could hear a horse charging about in the field the other side of this hedge and stamping and snorting and apparently getting quite cross about the presence of the dog mm. so they were talking to each other like oh i'm not sure crossing this field is going to be a good idea because it sounds like that horse is quite agitated about the dog so it, you know might not be safe to cross and the husband had said well we'll, we'll walk to the end of the hedge and we'll look across because i have a feeling there's a fence between where we're going and where that is the horse is yeah. so we're probably going to be safe to walk across the field but we'll have a look so they got to the end of the hedge and turned into the edge of the field sort of carefully to see if there was indeed a fence keeping them safe from this angry horse, only to find there was absolutely nothing in the field whatsoever. Mm. No livestock of any description, mm. completely empty field. So they have no explanation for whatever it was that kept snorting and stamping and running up and down the other side of the hedge where they were walking. Um, and then another chap wrote in to me who lives in the high street in the village. He's got one of the old cottages on the high street. So the door steps open, you know, sort of almost straight onto the high street. And he'd stepped out late one evening, probably to put the milk bottles or something in the bin or whatever. And he just stood for a moment on the doorstep. He said it was quite late. It was getting on for midnight. Um, just kind of taking in the night air for a moment like you do. It was a really peaceful, lovely, balmy summer's evening. When he suddenly realised he could hear the sound of a horse's hooves clip clopping down the high street. And he thought, who on earth riding a horse around at midnight <laughs> so he, he stopped to wait to see because of course you know the first thought is somebody stealing a horse you know um and the sound actually clipped clopped down the high street and past his cottage and on down but there was nothing to be seen and he says he, he says loads of his friends have said to him oh you, you must just have heard a like a coke can rolling in the breeze or something but he said to me but honestly I know the sound of hoofbeats and it was very clearly a horse that went past me. Um, and then another lady wrote to me and said that early one morning she'd gone out to see to her own horses who were a bit agitated and she actually saw across the field a horse and rider but they were kind of glowing orange like with an orange outline around them and she can't explain what that was that she saw. I can. And then yet another person. It's ready, Brett. Yes, ready, Brett. Children, <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> um, and, and this, uh, you know, the, the the final person who wrote in to me said that um, they were coming home to the village late at night um, with friends from you know a night out, and down one of the lanes, in the headlights of the car, a horse suddenly burst through the hedge, crossed the road, and burst through the hedge the other side and disappeared but the whole time it was just the outline of a horse not like a solid figure of a horse mm. so it was like seeing something off the matrix you know just this sort of 
outline of a horse that galloped across the road in front of the car. Weird. So I got all these corroborations that are all horse related around this one village. Um, and and that one just, uh, and I've spent several nights parked, parked up around Risley trying to no avail, sadly. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you were a stalker of Risley at that time, weren't you? There's a, I whole, am. <laughs> there's a whole mythology built up around this lady that sits in her car just in various areas around Risley. <laughs> So you do yourself actually go out and visit these locations you write about? I try to whenever I can. I mean, obviously, you know, time and funds and what have you always limited. Um, You know, so some of the because my books cover the whole of the UK, with the exception of Ghost of Marston Vale, the other three cover the whole of the UK. Then obviously, I, you know, I haven't been able to get around them all or anything. But any time I'm traveling anywhere for any reason. I look in my own database or my own books to see if I'm going anywhere near, yeah. um, you know, a haunted location from one of my <laughs> researches. And I always make the effort to go and sort of drive down the road or visit the church or the battle site or whatever it might be and see if I can, you know, get any evidence there. Oh, right. Um, well, the and there you go, Paul. Stephanie, we need to get a copy of the book. Definitely. For our travels. Yeah. Well, I've got a copy of the Almanac, and I think it's a, a great book for it, improving your chances if you want to see a ghost. You know, if you turn up at a certain place at a certain time, you know, you, you stand a fairer chance with this. Uh, the Almanac was a brilliant book for that. And fascinating in its own right, you know, because you say we have these reoccurring occurrences of ghosts. And uh, you was telling me a story when we was talking about that once about a lady who who rides down a lane, infamous lady, um, and you'd researched that one. Can you remember that one? Yeah, actually, that one that one's in Ghosts of Marston Vale, oh, okay. um, uh, and she's actually that's the the story <clears throat> of um, Lady Snag, who you know, famous dignitary around here, um, you know, owned all the land and what have you, and the effigy of Lady Snag and lord snag are in the local church um and the legend is that her headless ghost and headless horse that she's riding haunt a particular lane around here um galloping at pell-mell and the legend is that they, she haunts that lane because she'd been galloping home from an illicit visit with her lover and was trying to get home before her husband noticed she was missing and some robbers had strung a rope across the road and she hit it at speed and it decapitated her. And they very callously went ahead and robbed the still warm body. And she was found the next morning decapitated and robbed. And that's the legend. When you actually look into the story, Lady Snag died in her 80s. <laughs> so... <laughs> I find it a little difficult to believe that she was galloping around in the middle of the night visiting her illicit lover, but hey. <laughs> Feisty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know what the girls are like around your way, but... Yeah. <laughs> and, and obviously, you know, there were plenty of other, you know, in the family over the years, there were plenty of Lady Snags, but the one that everybody caught, you know, thinks of as Lady Snag is the one that died in her 80s. And I did look to see whether there were any younger members of the family that met an untimely death due to robbery or murder or anything, and I couldn't find any. Um, but I did find two people who had some sort of an account with a rushing horse-type ghost down that lane. Um, so... That and a number of other stories, particularly in, you know, in Highway itself and in Elmnack, you often find a lot of headless highwaymen um, or famous figures riding around on horses like Oliver Cromwell or, um, you know, Anne Boleyn or whoever it might be. And I often think that the truth behind these is that there is a haunting down, you know, whichever road it is or... Um, you know, behind whichever building it is, but it's getting ascribed to somebody famous to do with that area mm -hmm. rather than actually whoever the ghost actually is, because it makes a much more exciting story 
if you say, oh, yes, that's the ghost of Oliver Cromwell, then you say, yeah, there is a ghost down there, but it's just, you know, Farmer Ted who lived down the end of the lane. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think over the centuries, you know, they get ascribed to the famous figures because it makes more exciting news. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly does. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Paranormal UK Radio Network tonight to talk about your book. Where can people find you, Ruth? Um, if you just type my name, Ruth Roper Wild, and the wild is spelt W-Y-L-D-E, um, into Google, you can pick me up on my Facebook page. You can pick me up on Twitter. You can pick me up on Pinterest. Um, and the books themselves, all four of them, are available from Amazon both as ebooks or if you've got Kindle Unlimited you can read them for free or you can buy them in paperback whichever is your preferred media. They are available from other booksellers as well and you should be able to ask your library to get in a copy if you want to get them that way. But the the main source to get them is Amazon. Yes I have uh, all of them sitting in my basket at them as we speak. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I like to hear. <laughs> Well, I've already got the almanac, but I'll definitely be buying Roadmap, definitely. Um, absolutely fantastic books, everybody. I, I totally recommend uh, you check Ruth's work out. Um, she's an absolutely amazing researcher and collection of, of ghost stories from around the UK. So definitely go check that one out, guys. I'd like to say thank you once again, Ruth, for joining us tonight uh, today on uh, the Paranormal Concept Show. And you'll come back and talk to us again when you release another book, Yes. I absolutely well because uh, uh, I've just released um, Haunted Times Volume 1 and I'm working on Haunted Times Volume 2 at the moment. Oh, so it stuff. would be a delight to come back and talk to you. Brilliant. That would be absolutely fantastic. So for now, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be coming back just after. So I'll be with you right in a minute. <laughs> Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? And welcome back. Um, right, yes, yeah, so let's crack on with some of the research that we've uh, found on some of the uh, roads and byways and highways of the UK. Although we did find some Australian ones as well. I thought I'd get them in for Richard. Oh, OK. He loves That's my department, is it? Yeah, <laughs> so I've read research now. <laughs> yeah, where are they in the research? <laughs> talking to Ruth and, and very much what we were saying before and um, we, we spoke to her wasn't it about finding the mechanics of it and you know actually distilling it down and when she was saying that she likes the the um, original story you know stories that aren't actually yeah. out there you know it's like the, the personal stories and tr- trying to find the corrobor- corroboration there you go <laughs> big word there everybody um, yeah. you know that was fascinating but yeah I mean one one of the ones which you spoke about um, we spoke about post um, interview was actually one that she said she wouldn't touch because it's so hyped up isn't it is the Bluebell Hill one Paul it, yeah it's the Bluebell Hill um, I grew up not far from there so I know that quite well mm. uh, and it is reported that um, I that in um, 1965, a bride ran away from her wedding, basically, and she was killed by a, a driver. Um, and people have reported seeing her ghostly presence on the side of the road. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it sort of... I, th- I think it changes slightly sometimes because of Chinese whispers, but that's sort of the... Like the, the gist of it, basically. You sort uh, but it is up, so well known as well. That... You you sort of bring up this subject, say on haunted roads. I mean, Bluebell Hill will always crop up, possibly yeah. at the top of everyone's list. And I think it's one of those stories now. It's been so diluted 
over the years, if there was, you know, it would be very difficult to actually sort of discern any sort of fact from what's actually sort of been added to over the years. Yeah. I will say, though, there is um, a location that we investigate quite a bit down by Bluebell Hill. It's actually at the bottom of the hill um, called the Kent Life Museum. And they've got um, some like 1940s, 1950s buildings and Oast House as well in their um, their museum type thing. And that is quite active. That is a very active place. So I don't know whether or not it's something to do with what's what the hill's made of. Because I know it's all chalk. Um, so maybe it's sort of... I don't, I don't know whether or not it's sort of... Um, associated with the calcium possibly yeah so you would be thinking that it's something to do with the environment around you know the yeah immediate locale as opposed to a pacific sort of uh, narrowing it down to a pacific spot and a pacific haunting exactly mm. it, it is interesting definitely a, a, an interesting place and apparently there's a lot of ufo sightings around <laughs> blue Hill as well that that's another one that doesn't get mentioned quite a bit, but yeah, again, sort of uh, growing sort up of... in that general vicinity. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you're because yeah, you are from the Medway area, aren't you? So... Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there is a coal house. Uh, no, not coal house fault. Um, fort Amherst. That's yeah. another fault. Um, not too far away from Bluebell Hill, and that is built primarily inside chalk caves. Yeah, well, the whole sort of Medway Valley along there, which would incorporate uh, Bluebell Hill, yeah, sort yeah. of like you follow the Medway up towards the Medway towns, sort of you've got Fort Anne, and what's that, Chatham, Gillingham, yeah. uh, Rochester, you know, Maidstone, so, sort of yeah, yeah, so it's certainly sort of like a valley area, which is sort of steeped in a lot of history has gone on around that place, so... Absolutely, and yeah, I mean, it could be something to do with chalk. We just don't know at the moment. I don't understand I think... why chalk would... Limestone, yeah, but not chalk. There's a lot of reports, you yeah. know, when you look into the geology of an area that limestone's um, very prevalent in those areas, um, but not chalk. But then if you go on the theory, if, and that's a big if, you go on the theory of water, you look at the porousness of the rocks, chalk is incredibly porous. Yeah. Um, and will hold water, same as maybe limestone. Maybe both. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe they can work in conjunction with each other. Yeah, especially with chalk, you might, I uh, mean, water would probably uh, even flow through chalk as opposed yeah. to remaining static, which is, an, you know, running water, underground sources of water. Yeah, who knows? Maybe, yeah. and maybe it's to do with um, the amplification or the resonance of what the water creates rather than the actual mm. water memory bit itself, I don't know. Um, well, and so a that's, well there, that's one of the concepts I was looking at in regards to water rather than water memory was the, because a, a lot of, well I say a lot, 99% of hauntings, everyone attribute or you know, looks to the water source. Where's the water source? And obviously, it's the most yeah. common element on the planet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, water is, and it's always there somewhere. Do you know what I mean? And you look at humidity levels; it's in the air, it's in the you know underground streams. It's it's there. So whether or not that element, in, anyway, I'm going off topic. I'm going into musings now, um, <laughs> rather than the topic. Um, but that that's what the geology of the area I think is important, but I don't think it's the reason. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's interesting. Yeah. As I said, it's an interesting concept and you could go into it all day, but we haven't got all day. No, we haven't got all day. And we, it is <laughs> one that um, we talk about, you know, when we're off air and we, we're just talking, we do kind of go around this sort of, it always comes back to that, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's certainly something you know you can't get away from. It's always sort of you know it's it still holds a very high 
place in sort of paranormal research or for paranormal researchers to visit i mean you know the you know water sources and the sort of uh, the geology of the land i mean there's certainly it certainly points towards it's a possible sort of uh connection there but quite what it is uh, we don't know no, oh, that's the thing, isn't it? Now, going back to what we were talking about last week, we were talking about Newgate Prison last week. Um, yeah. So, guys, if you missed that show um, on the Paranormal UK Radio Network, you can go back on um, and check that out over on Podbean. Um, so just type in Paranormal UK Network and it will come up. Now, or, there is... Or you could also go to our website, oh, which yeah. is uh, paranormalconcept.com. And click on shows, and I've listed them there as well. Very and it'll take true. it's a link that goes straight to Podbean as well. Very, very true. Sorry, missed that one. Always miss that one. <laughs> um, we were talking about that, and we were talking about the Old Bailey in London, which is obviously where Newgate Prison used to be, is now the Old Bailey in London. And there's a lane there called Cock Lane. And there, there, is, a, there is an alleged haunting on the street of two women who died in the 1760s. So apparently you can hear strange noises and screams as you travel past. But again, in any part of like, you know, a busy... Well, we've just heard it doesn't really matter whether it's a busy city or a back lane or anything. It is interesting how noise is the noise phenomena. Mm-hmm. Is... See, I mean, it, it could also be like foxes. I know, you know, it, especially in the rural areas. Why do you even towns sometimes like they have foxes? But when when you get the female foxes scream, I don't know if you've ever heard that, but that does look sound like a woman screaming. Well, on um, the I very used to work at um, I used to work at Bexley um, Mental Health Hospital as a security guard, and we had to, it was a massive big Victorian hospital, and they even had like mansion houses dotted around, so we had to go. I had to go around all those. But the amount of times you go down the dark paths and there's like trees overhanging and everything, and then you start hearing these foxes scream, it's like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Is someone being murdered? <laughs> I'll just go back to my office and wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, I stayed in a hotel in Banbury um, once. It's quite remote, and grouse were in the woods when they. Uh... When they're shouting and you know shouting at night, that is a very unnerving sound, and it was yeah. only it was horrible because I didn't didn't know what a grouse was. I didn't know there was grouse mm. in the area. Do you know what I mean? And I was talking to the lady the next morning, saying there was horrible noises at night. She goes, "Oh, it's just the grouse in the woods," and it was like because of the you. It's because you don't know it because it's not familiar. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit like I can remember years ago when I was really young when I first heard two cats fighting outside my bedroom window and that was quite hard. I was quite upset by hearing that. My mum and dad had to come running into the room whilst I was standing on my bed screaming. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> I can imagine a Ned Flanders type of screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Um, haunted highway kind of hauntings were linked to um, inns. I mean, there's that famous one of Jamaica in the road that runs past Jamaica, yeah. and you can hear a horse, you know, hear your horses, and um, even going into the um, courtyard in front of, of Jamaica, and you can allegedly hear horses gather, gathering and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so that's yeah. all on the road. So, and there are, uh, you know, when you think about it, the inns back in Tutdeer would have been stopping places, you know, the, the, their break places, aren't they, um, for people. So it would have had a lot of traffic through those. And so, yeah, I can understand why, like, inns and pubs these days are linked to the haunt, you know, that they'll follow the, those routes, won't they? Yeah. Well, yeah, because we don't realise today, I mean, what we class as sort of backcountry lanes now back in the day were main thoroughfares and mm -hmm. they were very busy sort of roads you know sort of back in the sort of 1700s but today you know we sort of look at them they sort of wind through little villages and stuff there's not a lot on them and it's quite difficult to sort of like imagine what they would have been like sort of when they were sort of main roads linking sort of major cities and towns and villages mm. 
Exactly. And now, did we find any that were linked to, like, we talked to, um, uh, the last couple of weeks, we brought up that, you know, like, crossroads and yep. gibbeting were always done on, on roads, weren't they, to, to serve yeah. as a warning to the community that you act like this and you'll get hung and gibbeted, right? <laughs> did we find any that linked to that? Were there any hauntings, like, that were linked to that, did we find? Um, I don't think so. <coughs> they Wait, seemed no, to be a lot more modern, didn't they? Yeah. It was um, either horses on horse and carts or, you know, like the dandy highwaymen type hauntings yeah. of, you know, sort of thing. But we also found, like, a lot more modern things and accidents happened, um, you know, and people have seen the accident or seen the person that was killed in the accident kind of scenario. Like yeah. Sally in the Woods in Wiltshire. This is um, a sight of a young girl who was supposed to have been struck when run over, basically. She ran into the road and, and got run over. And she's been reported numerous times. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's been so many reportings of this one. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, accidents have actually caused because people have swerved to avoid and uh, she had an accident because of this alleged situation and it does make you wonder doesn't again it brings up so many questions to me mm. of what it is you know because if it was ah see this is the thing isn't it it's it seems to be if it was i would imagine that it would be across all sorts of not just because there was an accident or because someone got run over or because it was on a main thoroughfare back in today or you know, <clears throat> it, it never ceases to amaze me that it doesn't seem to be what you would expect it to be. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly something uh, otherworldly and connected to it. I mean, you know, it's not... Most people would assume, oh, there's been an accident or there's been someone died. But, you know, is there something more going on here? You know, sort of because some of these sort of like incidences and stuff are quite bizarre what people report as opposed to your more sort of mundane sort of ghostly type sightings. So it sort of like leaves a lot a, a lot broader scope to actually look at when sort of like in, in studying these sorts of sightings. I mean... You know, because because some of the stuff that it does border on high strangeness, and particularly uh, as as we were talking with uh, Ruth, you know, some of the more like black shuck sight and, and sightings, and uh, some of the more sort of like what you would call werewolves or stuff like that, which do actually at the end of the day sound quite bizarre. But these are actually being reported. Yeah. I mean, also, I mean, it, it could also be time slips as well. So we're sort of crossing into other dimensions and things like that then. Exactly. It is a difficult one to pin down. I mean, we talk about we talk about hauntings as it's come away from the haunting of an old building and, you know, um, <laughs> you know, chains rattling and, and white misty apparitions, hasn't it? We've evolved in the field. And, you know, we we've got certain preconceived ideas like if you're changing a building, like you're know, decorating or yeah. causing, um, you know, disruption to a building, it tends to trigger um, activity. You know, yeah. the, many cases come up where, oh, well, we're just doing some decorating and then all of a sudden this weird stuff started to happen. And this actually happened at Stockbridge Bypass, which is actually in Sheffield. Oh, yeah. um, they were building a new road to connect the M1 with the Woodhead Pass and the A1616. Um, and when they started doing this work, they started to report unusual occurrences. And they, while it was being constructed, and this is where I bring this theory up, is because while it was being constructed, two of the security guards actually witnessed children playing in the middle of the site. And they were obviously, they were like, that's not right, kids, off <coughs> you go. But when they sort of like, they were shocked because obviously kids, and where that is as well. Yeah, they stopped. The Stockbridge Bypass incident is, again, that is quite a famous one now, it's, but it's relatively recent. I mean, it happened back in uh, 1988, I believe, and uh, it was covered on a, a 
there was a show with Michael Aspel used to host, uh, Strange But True. And, uh, yeah, the uh, security guards actually sort of first witnessed a sort of like an apparition of a group of children sort of doing something like Ring of Ring of Roses, sort of just in the middle of a field. But what was surprising, they were actually sort of like doing it under power lines, which sort of brings into question, I mean, could that have caused this, triggered this apparition to actually occur? Well, so you mean like they're they're feeding the energy off of the the power lines? Well, yeah, because uh, they were actually doing uh, the Ring of Ring of Roses or whatever game they were playing round like a a power pylon. But it was quite clear to the guards when they actually witnessed this that they were sort of like in Victorian type sort of garb, you know, so... uh, yeah, it's certainly an interesting one. And the way the story actually progresses, because that basically started off the incident and then over the coming months, and years, sort of, uh, I think it more developed into some form of sort of darker entity that was actually haunting the sort of like the immediate locality of the bypass. Mm-hmm. I'm not too sure if anything's still going on there today, but it was certainly recorded over a period of time since the bypass was being constructed up until relatively recently. Yeah. So was that the first time that that story was put out there, was on that programme? Uh, yes, I believe it was. Uh, it's Again, it's another one, you know, whether it is sort of like the Bluebell Hill, uh, you know, it got maximum coverage when it actually happened and then it took legs of its own and people were sort of adding bits and pieces to it. I don't know. But the actual clip, uh, the programme is uh, strange but true, it's called, and, yeah, and if you put that into a YouTube search, that actual segment of the show will come up Mm. yeah which it was highly popular at the time so like you say is it now sort of like set into our our um psyche and then people are experiencing it and like it becomes a an urban urban legend as it were yeah you ask any sort of paranormal investigator type ghost hunter, you say you put out sort of haunted highways and they will probably come up with a bluebell hill and the Stockbridge bypass Definitely. I, one one I found quite interesting was the M6. Right. All oh, right. Because apparently it's the longest road in the UK. They reckon about 230 miles it is. And the road has existed for nearly over 2,000 years. Okay. And it was even used by Roman soldiers during Roman occupation of England back in 55 and uh, 55 BC. So, yeah, obviously, you know, the... the it wouldn't have been like it is now, but it's just it would have been a road, and um, but a lot of motorists have reported on the M6 having witnessed um, unusual phenomena, like Roman soldiers marching across the road. Okay, so a bit like um, what you saw at the Treasury House in um, York. Yeah. So that would be interesting because the the would it be because in in the Treasury House it was only from their knees up that that it gets seen do you know what i mean because the road level was lower Mm -hmm. so surely the m6 is built higher than the original roman road yes uh, uh, i mean i I don't know um, you would have some things but yeah i would have thought so yeah i certainly know that stretches of the m6 now are actually built directly on top of the roman road i mean parts of it aren't but it does follow the general course of the roman road but certainly parts of it probably the straight parts <laughs> um, yeah. more than likely are actually built directly on top of the Roman road because it's such good foundations. They certainly made, made stuff to last back then. Yes, they did. Well, we're all going to have to learn how to do that again, I feel. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and haven't there been eyes, just like nothing linked to the eyes, just the eyes being seen along that road as well? Yeah, it's probably cat's eyes. Yeah, there's loads of them down the middle. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, I was sort of looking at the research here. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it does say that there's been uh, reported sort of just eyes. I mean, it doesn't really go into much detail. It could be anything though, but especially birds. So, do you think reputation then has a lot to do with this? Because you know, in the night 
we were dri- going back to Epping Forest when we was looking at that pole. Um, we when we drove through there, do you remember seeing all the deer? And it was a bit freaky yeah. because it, we didn't see the deer; we just saw their eyes light up in the car light. Oh, that that with. was a um, that was a Kelvin Hatch. Was as it? You, yeah, as you drive out of Kelvin Hatch, you've got loads of deer there, <laughs> and they do they watch you, and mm-hmm. we see is like the silhouette of the obviously of the deer, but you also get to see the eyes glaring. I I also got this when we when I was driving back from uh, Rotham Tower from uh, Kerry's little birthday bash we had, yeah. and uh, I was going down the uh, the the A fourteen and it was yeah. quite foggy that night and when I left and uh, yeah and I was quite surprised to have come across a herd of deer standing right in the middle of the road <laughs> and that is a busy road but uh, yeah. It was, uh, but it was the eyes that sort of caught me first. I was getting these sort of like glints, and I thought, "What was that?" And then emerging out and and out of the fog was a herd of deer, big <laughs> and big yeah. ones as well. And, yeah, um, it, it was a lot. Yeah. yeah, I think I I don't remember that one um, uh, where you're talking uh, talking about Paul, but I I definitely had that in Epping Forest and. We didn't see the silhouette of the deer. It was literally just the eyes that, and yeah. we were like, oh, oh, dear. Do you know what I mean? It's, it took that momentary, <laughs> that's what that is. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. it was like you couldn't actually see the body of the deer. So um, it is something that you have to be aware of. And there is a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a lot of, like, nature around that you have to be aware of. It's like, like Richard said, Especially... some of them are big. They're not little creatures. Yeah. You, know, you think badgers and foxes, they're low to the <laughs> ground. Deer are quite big at times, we, you know. Also, also around motorways, you've got a lot of um, natural hunting birds, like the kite, for example. Mm-hmm. And you know, they they hunt around there. So you know, you, you've always got that sort of wildlife there. Um, and maybe they just nest up in the bushes. I, I, I don't really know where they go. To be fair, but um, <laughs> you know, they, they might have just they just might hide in the bushes and stuff, and then wait for daylight and then off they go flying around and you know so yeah i mean even owls as well you mm. know they're, they're quite big and they're bigger they're, than they're you back. think there are species that are tiny but there are bigger species yeah. than you think i mean i saw a um oh i was lucky enough i think to see one of the big golden ones can't remember what they're called now not snowy owl the the next one up and they're actually quite they're a bit bigger than you think they are so when they've got their like yeah wingspan out or whatever and it's at night you're not necessarily yeah. going to see them and no, so when, yeah so when you say people see eyes you you kind of have to but is it the emotion at the same time so you you get that first initial of ooh, what's that kind of fight or flight response yeah. and then you maybe you get a recognition because you've encountered it before or you've heard about it before your knowledge is is enough to know that you're in an area with deer or whatever you know mm-hmm. so is it a point of because you don't recognize it you put it down to a mo your fight or flight response stays longer i think this might sort of have something to do with sort of like the the people that see them as well i mean for myself, if I, I'm used to seeing deer, so but uh, if you're going down a major road and you're driving and you're from like the sort of the city and stuff, and you're not used to seeing stuff like this, and if you do come across it late and uh, late at night, it it can probably really throw you. I mean, even when I see them, I have that initial sort of oh, but I soon process of what I'm actually looking at, but yeah. I can actually quite understand why some people could get totally freaked out by seeing what they're seeing and not identify it with anything they know because they have yeah. no reference. And it, it, also sort of depends like... on, it also depends on what they see, uh, what they know about the location as well. Yeah. yeah because, yeah. for example, I don't know, you're driving along Bluebell Hill, for example, you know there's parent, you know, that you know, you've heard the stories of paranormal activity around there. And then as you drive past a bush, you start seeing like, glowing red eyes looking at you, you you're going to jump to the conclusion that it could be paranormal especially with someone that's not into it as yeah such. so it, we're back to interpretation aren't we of what you're yeah. witnessing and whether or not that is paranormal whether or not that is a um an you know a phenomena 
or whether or not it was actually a logical explanation, just misinterpretate, <laughs> you know, the misinterpretation yeah. and the interpretation of your own belief system comes into that of whether or not, you know, if you're really into UFOs and you see a strange light, you might jump to the assumption it's a UFO rather than, oh, it could have been somebody with a torch or something yeah. like that. Do you know what I mean? You know, your interpretation of that event, uh, because it's out of your comfort zone of context... Well, that's right, because uh, when I moved to Australia and lived there for a while, I had to get used to a whole raft of new fauna and fauna, you know, and animals and stuff, you know, kangaroos and stuff sort of going across the road in the middle of the night in front of you. And uh, the first time I saw that, something hopping across the road in front of me, I didn't know what the hell it was. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine but it's yeah. a fascinating case study isn't it of looking at haunted highways and the stories that are, you can understand Ruth's fascination with um, with it I mean she, hopefully she'll write a book too because I say her books are absolutely brilliant guys go check them yeah. out and nice I'll say know. it again because she is brilliant um, a brilliant writer and it is um, it is that in, like she, even she says it's the interpretation of the event isn't it and how it can get changed from a whole kind, yeah. you know, that village that she was talking about. It was like it's been taken on in life of its own in this village that's got actually nothing to do with it. It was over here in a different county completely. And how it's, it evolves and changes, and yet we take it as fact. Yeah, yeah. and I think there's like a good lesson to be learned by all, you know, sort of as researchers and stuff like that, is don't take everything at face value. Do your research. Do your due diligence. Yeah, you know, dig a bit deeper sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, totally. have a look at the area and see if there's anything that could have explained it rather than jump straight to that ghost story. But mm. they make great ghost stories, right? Yes, oh, but we all really? like the ghost stories, yeah, and they are great. And they are sort of, especially more than modern ones, they are our modern folk tales, aren't they? Our modern sort of folklore yeah. is derived from them. So there's that aspect as well you can study. Which is just as fascinating. It's oh, just it as is. fascinating. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, on that note, my lovely men, we've actually come to the end of the show. Oh, that was quick. And, yeah, it goes so quickly, two hours. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> we need to do a three-hour show, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might be overcooking it a bit there. Uh, maybe. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> On that note, we'd like to thank all of the listeners for joining us on the Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, and we will see you here next week. Good night. Say good night, guys. Good night. Good, good night. night.